Well, last Sunday morning, we began a message entitled, Born to Restore. And last Sunday, I talked to you. Hi, David and family. God bless y'all. So good to see you. Sorry. Long time members hadn't seen in a while. Hallelujah. Not that they hadn't been to church. They moved to Pennsylvania. <laughs> Praise God. But, but last Sunday, I began a message entitled, Born to Restore. And I talked to you last week that the first thing that, that uh, Jesus was born to restore was, he was born to restore us back into our position and our condition and our right as children of God. Let me remind you of the definition of restore. The definition of restore means to return something or someone to a former condition. Listen, when, we, when man sinned in the Garden of Eden, man's condition was then lost without God. Prior to that, man was able to walk in the cool of the day with the voice of God. You know, I know this may be corny, but I just think that's pretty cool. Walking in the cool of the day with the voice of God. And, uh, and, man, and man was clothed in the glory of God. That was the condition of man. Clothed in his glory, walking with his voice in the cool of the day. And then Adam and Eve sinned and man lost that condition. But Jesus came to restore us back to that condition. Woo! Glory to God. And then, not only that, though, man lost their place. Their place. Man was kicked out of the garden and had to now sweat with the, you know, had to now work for the, with the sweat of their brow in order to earn a living. Their place now was amongst the world like everyone else. But Jesus came to restore us back to our rightful place. And our rightful place is not living, not abiding, not standing, not learning, not getting all that we want and need from the kingdom of darkness. Our place is in the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of healing and deliverance and safety and soundness of mind and prosperity, the kingdom of new creatures in Christ. Can you say amen? Our place is in him, seated in heavenly places far above. Glory to God. And then not only that, but he came to restore our position. Our position. Glory to God. And what is our position? Our position is that we stand in authority. The position that we were given in the garden was to keep it and guard it and take care of it and be fruitful and multiply. And we had dominion. Over everything in the garden, dominion over everything that was creeping in the garden, every animal and all the little things that creeped. So that means we have dominion over creeps. And I'm telling you right now, I don't know about you, but many times in the world there are some creeps. Well, a couple of y'all didn't know whether to say amen or what on that. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. But we have dominion over them. Glory to God. And then not only that, it means to repair or renovate to a former original condition. But then to bring back a previous right custom practice or situation. So Jesus was born to restore mankind back into, as I said, our former condition, our former position, and our former rights. There are rights that we have in the kingdom of God. And we have a right to come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain grace and find mercy to help in a time of need. We have a right to all that the, king, all that the word of God promises. We have a right. Can you say amen? And so as I said last week, I shared with you that the first thing that I wanted all of us to take hold of is that Jesus was born to restore us back into that place, that position, and that right, and that condition as the children of God. Because the Word of God says we were foreigners without God, didn't know God. We were on the outside looking in. 
But now through the blood of Jesus, he has restored us back into that relationship and back into that position and back into that condition and back into that right. Listen, we got refrigerator rights. Y'all know what that means, right? Refrigerator rights. That means you go to someone's home that you're not familiar with. You don't have refrigerator rights at that house. You can't get up just, where you go? I'm going to the refrigerator. Get what I want. But when you're at home, you don't have to ask mom or dad, can, can I go to the, well, maybe some people do. But anyway, moving right along, I knew growing up, I didn't go to the refrigerator and just get anything I want out. But anyway, moving right along. But I still have refrigerator rights, okay? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Listen, in the kingdom of God, we got refrigerator rights. We can go get our need met. We can go receive our healing. We can go get our prosperity. We can go take hold of it, glory to God. It's, it's ours. It belongs to us. Are y'all with us? Can you say amen? But today I want to talk to you about the fact that Jesus was born to restore peace and purpose. Listen, if you're not walking in peace, you will never fulfill your purpose. And if you're not fulfilling your purpose, you will not walk in peace. And there's a, but Jesus came to restore peace and he came to restore purpose. So open your Bibles if you will, if you will or, or turn in your, on your iPad or wherever, or look at the screen and let's look at Luke chapter 2 and we're going to begin reading in verse 1 out of the New King James Version. And it came to pass in those days there, that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Cyrenius was governing of Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was, and so it was, and so it was. I believe there's a, and so it was coming. Hallelujah. And it says, and so it was, and while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. I believe that it's time. And I believe God's about to show himself strong on behalf of the body of Christ. And I believe there's some things going on in our world that God's about to show up and deliver right now so all the world can see and know that it was God. I told you last week that God has a thousand ways to deliver you. And we, we, don't, we can't think up a thousand ways. But God has a thousand ways to deliver you out of whatever circumstances we're in. He has a thousand ways to do it. Glory to God. Look at verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. There was no room for them in the inn. No room. I've heard preachers preach on TV. I've heard preachers say, I've heard Christians say, well, you know, you know, Jesus was poor and he wants us to stay humble and poor. We need to stay poor so we'll be humble. Can I share this with you? Jesus was not poor. You, you, you don't need a treasurer if you're poor. You don't need somebody to take care of the money and a treasurer to go with you wherever you are. Judas Iscariot, the one that betrayed Jesus, was a thief, but yet he was the treasurer of Jesus' uh, you know, evangelistic association. Hallelujah. And I've heard preachers say, well, you see that they couldn't, uh, couldn't afford the hotel, so they stayed in the manger. It ain't got nothing to do we couldn't afford. There was no room. There was no, va there was no vacancy sign hanging out. Are y'all with me? Hallelujah. And I've heard people say, well, G you know, the Peter, you know, Jesus said this. Jesus said, foxes have holes. Birds of the air have a nest. But the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. Talking about Jesus being poor. Jesus wasn't talking about not having anyone. Come on, are y'all with me? God, no, Jesus was not poor. The, the Bible says he did become poor so that we could be rich. 
but it wasn't poor financially. Are y'all with me? When you leave heaven and your daddy's streets are made with gold, no matter what you get on earth, you're going to be poor. Are y'all with me? I mean, when your community is filled with nothing, I mean, I'm talking nothing but big mansions, and you come down there and you live in a really nice neighborhood. You you might be in a big old houses in your neighborhood compared to heaven. Are y'all with me? But now listen, the Bible says, and I've heard preachers talk about Peter and John when they were going up to the gate, to the temple, and they got at the gate beautiful, and this guy was there lame, and he said, look on us. And he was looking at them because he was begging, expecting to receive something from them, and Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. See, the apostles were poor. Listen, I don't have any silver and gold in my pockets right now. I can't stand anything in my pockets to begin with. I don't like, I thank God my wife's got a purse. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I don't like anything in my pockets. But I'm not poor. Are y'all with me? Now, so, so they stayed in the inn. I mean, they stayed in the manger because there was no room in the inn. Now, look at verse 8. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were, they were greatly afraid. I truly believe from the bottom of my heart, as I said earlier, I'm going to say it again, I truly believe that we're about to step into a time of the glory of God shining around His church. Because right now the church has got to rise up. And we're going to look at a scripture in a minute. But I believe, listen, there was darkness in Egypt, but there was light in Goshen. There was famine in Egypt, but there was prosperity in Goshen. Are y'all with me? Glory to God. So I do believe that the time is now. We are in the last of the last days. God is setting up the end of the last days. And if you look around the world and you see the darkness covering the earth and gross darkness covering the people, then you will see that we are heading and very close to that time of Jesus' return. And any Christian ought to wake up and realize, I don't know when it's going to be. I don't know if it, nobody knows but God. The Son doesn't even know yet. Jesus doesn't even know, but let's open our eyes, church, and let's look around and let's see what is happening in the world, and let's wake up and realize that we are in the last of the last days, and if the glory of the Lord is going to rise on the church before the return of the Lord, then it might as well be on us, glory to God, on our generation, on us, that we can see it. Can you say amen? It's, you know, a rooster, everybody know what a rooster is? You know, a rooster is the one that crows in the morning. You know, cock-a-doodle do. I wonder, if you live on a farm, a rooster is what wakes up the family. But a rooster does not crow in the dark. You, you lock a rooster up in a dark room, he might scratch the walls, but he ain't going to crow. He's not going to cock-a-doodle-doo in the dark room. Why? He's waiting on the light to shine. Listen, church, it's time to rise up and cock-a-doodle-doo. It's time to rise up and let the world know who our God is, that his name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Emmanuel, God with us. We are the light of the world. Cock a doodle doo. How does it? I don't know. I forgot almost. I was trying to make a rooster sound and I can't even remember how it goes. Go to Isaiah 60 and look at verse 1. Very familiar scriptures. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Arise. This is Isaiah prophesying about our time, prophesying about our day. Arise, shine. He didn't say your light's coming. He said your light has come. So it's time to rise up and it's time to shine, church. And look at this. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, look at this now. If this didn't describe in our day, 
For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. If you don't think gross darkness is covering the people, then you need to wake up, and we need to look and see what's going on in our world. When full-term abortion is okay and accepted by leaders of our nation, then gross darkness is covering people. When they will allow a baby to be born, because then they don't want it, they'll let it die. If you don't tell me that's gross darkness, you need to get saved. Are you hearing me, church? Abortion is darkness. But gross darkness is full-term abortion, being pushed in our nation, being pushed in our political arena. And we need to rise up and let the glory of the Lord be seen upon us. And we need to rise up in prayer. And it said the glory of the Lord is risen. Not that it's going to be. And look at verse 3, and the Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. That means there's going to be a great harvest. I believe that if we'll just rise up as the church, as the body of Christ, and we'll just rise up and let the light of God shine within us, let the glory spend time in His presence, and then come out of walking with the cool of the day. How? They walk with the voice of God. We spend time with the voice of God, with His Word, in His presence, worshiping Him. And then when we leave that presence, what are we clothed with? Just like Adam and Eve, we're clothed with the glory of God. He came to restore us to that position. We're clothed with His glory, and if we're clothed with His glory, then arise and shine for the light of the, the glory because the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. And when there's darkness covering the earth and gross darkness covering the people, then rise up and let the glory of the Lord. And then what happens is the Gentiles will come at the shining. That means there'll be a great harvest. With 2020 the way it has been, I believe 2021 is going to be a year of great harvest. Great harvest, great harvest of souls, great harvest of families, great harvest of finances. I believe it's going to be a year of great harvest as the church rises and lets the light of God shine. Can you say amen? Look at Luke 2, verse 10, and I got to hurry. Then it says, the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Verse 11, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And suddenly, whoo, I just believe there are going to be some suddenlies. I really believe it. I really believe it in the bottom of my heart. And this service has been a little different than first service, but I can just tell you, I just believe from the bottom of my heart there are going to be some suddenlies. Suddenly. Suddenly. Suddenly, suddenly, who's open for suddenly from God? He's a over and above God. He's a too much God. How many of you are ready for suddenly from God? Glory to God. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heaven lows praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth. Now this angel's these angels are singing this, they're praising this, but they are making a declaration. Their declaration is glory to God in the highest. But then they say something, because Jesus has come, and the reason they're about to say this is the babe is born. The son has come. He's come to what? Restore. So what's he come? What did they say on earth? On earth, peace. On earth, peace. Goodwill to all men. Now, how many of you know right now we need peace like never before? And I mean, we, we need to follow peace. And I don't have to teach on peace because you know if you don't have peace in here, you're not supposed to do something. Don't do it. And, and if there's no peace in it, don't go there. If there's no peace in it, don't, don't get involved with it. And I know the many times that I violated that peace that I've messed up. I've made bad decisions. I, 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 I've, I've, I've made decisions that didn't, they didn't turn out right. Why? 
because, and then when they don't turn out right, then you sit there and say, well, you know, I really didn't have peace about that. But I did it anyway. <laughs> Duh. And I mean, I, I wish I could just stand up and say it's only one time. Because it seemed like you'd learn after the one time. Don't y'all look at me so holy. Anybody here ever done it more than once? Come on, tell the truth. We all have. Hallelujah. But the neat thing about it is our God's so faithful. He's such a loving, awesome God. He just receives us right back. And then he'll, that peace, he'll use that peace again. He'll try to use peace again to keep us from doing something. And finally, we'll listen. Can you say amen? amen? But it says, came to release peace on earth and came to release goodwill toward all men. Now, I, I don't know how many times I've preached this scripture in 38 years, 38 Christmases. This is our 38th Christmas. And I don't know how many times I've preached this scripture in the 38 years at Christmas time. But I've never seen the definition of of goodwill that I'm going to share with you this morning. And it was right in the Strong's Concordance. So it's been there all the whole time. They didn't write a new one. It's been there the whole time. But the definition of purpose is kindness. I've seen that. The definition of purpose is um, desire. I had seen that. The definition of purpose is um, delight. I had seen that. I mean, the definition of goodwill is the definition of goodwill is kindness. The definition of desire is kindness. I mean, is <laughs> now y'all know what I'm trying to say. The definition of goodwill is kindness. The definition of what? Goodwill is desire. The definition of what? Goodwill. Is delight. And the definition of goodwill is purpose. Never seen that before. And I promise you this, that if you're not walking in peace, as I said earlier, you will not walk in purpose. Now, there are several things that I want you to see today in closing. I want you to see several things right now about purpose. Number one, God has a purpose for everybody here. God has a purpose for everyone in the world, saved and not saved. God has already, they, he already has a purpose for every poor person that has ever been born in the natural. Some never reach their purpose because they never get saved. However, God uses some unsaved people for his purpose. Hey, hey, hey. come on now. I know, sometimes, we, you know, religious folk can't accept this. God will use unsaved people for his purpose. He will. God's got a purpose for everyone. Exodus chapter 9, Pharaoh mistakenly thought he was in control. Yeah. Pharaoh thought, I'm the Pharaoh. I got this by inheritance from my father, from my daddy Pharaoh. I became the leader of the world. I'm the one in charge. That was a mistake. But look at verse 9. I mean, excuse me, Exodus 9, verse 16. And it says, for this purpose. Look at me just a minute. That's God talking to Pharaoh. That's God talking to the world. That's God talking to heathen and that he's raised up in a position. And some people can't think, well, I can't believe he let that person be in that position. I can't believe he let that person do that. I can't believe people say that all the time about people in different positions when you got to realize, church, listen to me, I'm sure nobody thought this new Pharaoh was a good dude. Come on now. But look at what God said to Pharaoh, for this purpose, I raised you up. He didn't do it. He thought he did it, but he didn't do it. So before y'all start complaining, griping, murmuring, 
running people down in different positions. Maybe you ought to read this scripture again for this purpose. I raised them up. Maybe we need to pray for them. Are y'all with me? Look at this. For this purpose, I've raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. The first thing I want you to know today is God has a purpose for everyone. Number two, God's purpose cannot be undone. God's purpose cannot be stopped by others. You can't stop my purpose. You might can slow it down a little bit if I let you. You can't stop. You cannot stop somebody else's purpose. The devil can't stop my purpose. Only I can stop it. Only you can stop your purpose. Job, we all know what happened to Job. We all know that the devil came and wanted to destroy Job, and we all know the story. We all know. I, I was in religion, I was in a religion class. I, I forget the exact name of the class, but it was a religion class. And we were all in there. And you know, back then you had one of the classes you had to take in college was religion. And uh, and so this this guy raises his hand and says, I don't really know much about that book called jo- Job. <laughs> the book called Job <laughs> I mean, I didn't know much. I wasn't saved, but I knew it was Job and not Job. Hello. But there are a lot of things in this book that we need to recognize and we need to realize. And, and that is God's purpose cannot be undone. And that's what Job said in Job 42. Look at verse 2. And it says, I know that you can do all things. This is what Job is saying. Look up at me just a minute. We know Job lost everything he had, all his children, his wife, his house, his cattle, every, all his, everything, he lost everything. But now look at what Job says. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. I don't use thwarted much. I, I don't... You know, boy, I hope that's thwarted. No, I use stopped. So we could read that scripture and say, Job is saying, There's, you can do all things, God, and no purpose of yours can be stopped. Right. Hallelujah. That all excites you to know that the devil can't stop your purpose. Are y'all with me? Now look at this. Look at Job 42, look at verse 7. And after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to, you know, all his friends, Eliphaz, and said, my anger burns again. Listen to this now. My anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And there's a lot of people running around our nation speaking things that are not right about our God. And our God is not going to put up with it much longer. You need to know he's the same. You need to know he doesn't change. You need to know you don't have to fight for God. God doesn't need us to fight for him in the natural. God's got a good reputation. God can take care of himself. All God needs us to do is do what he's called us in his word to do. Pray for those that so easily persecute us. Pray for those that despitefully use us. Pray for them and let God handle the other. And there are people that are talking about our God that it's not right. I believe God's anger is just as burning just as much now as it was then. Look at this. My anger burns against you and against your two friends. Look at this. For you've not spoken to me what is right as my servant Job has. Look up at me. Job's lost everything, but he's still talking good about God. I mean, why would in the world would we talk bad about God? Why would we complain about God? Job lost everything, but he's still talking good about God. Look at verse 8. Now, therefore, take seven bulls, seven rams, go to my servant Job, offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And look at this. And my servant Job's going to pray for you. That's a challenge to us. Pray for those that are coming against Christianity. 
Then it says, my servant Job is going to pray for you. Look at this. Why? For I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. Listen, church, it's up to us to pray on behalf of those that are not talking right about our God that are trying to place things in, in, in place and in positions that go against our God and go against Christianity. It's up to us to pray for them. Why? So that God's anger will be stopped. Are y'all with me? How I many you know he's the same God today? He's got grace and mercy. Are y'all hearing me? Now look at, look, look at this. Look at this. For I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your father. God will accept our prayer. For you have not spoken of me what's right. My servant Job has. Twice he said that about Job. So Elias, Elias, all those buddies, of those guys, friends of Job's, went and did what the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Now look at verse 10. And the Lord restored. I said, and the Lord restored. The fortunes of Job. Not just restored. What did Tom say? He's an over and above God. He's a too much God. He's a God that doesn't just want to restore what the devil has stolen. No. And he said, and he restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had. Come on, church. We need to be praying for our enemies. We need to be praying for those that are talking bad about our God. We need to be praying for those that are trying to put things in place to go against our God and Christianity. We need to be praying for them. And when we do, God will restore twice as much back to us that has been taken. Somebody ought to be shouting. We need to pray when they say another shutdown. We need to pray when they say restaurants can't do this and pray can't do that. We need to pray for them. Rather than some of the things I'd like to say. I'm human, but we need to pray. Why? Because God's the same, church. He's going to restore twice. So the first thing I want you to remember, that is God has a purpose for everybody. Second thing is God's purpose cannot be thwarted, (laughs) cannot be stopped. And the third thing is God works through all situations to fulfill His purpose. He works through all situations. Romans chapter 8 verse 28. And it says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Look up at me just a minute. Do you know how many times I hear that scripture quoted by people? Well, you know, brother, the Bible says all things work together for good for those who love the Lord are called according to His purpose. And their daughter just died. They got cancer and not expected to live. Well, you know, brother, all things work together for good. That's taking that scripture completely out of context. Because there's an and in front of we know. In one version, it's a, it's a so we are convinced that. You have to try verse 26 and verse 27 to verse 28. So that then you can honestly stand up and say, when you do verse 26 and you do verse 27, then you can can rest assured. This whole situation that's coming against me, this whole situation that I don't understand, I don't like, that the enemy's brought against me, God didn't bring it, But this whole situation that I'm going through right now, this whole COVID, this whole shutdown, this whole sickness, this whole everything, because verse 26 says, when we don't know what to pray for as we ought, the Holy Spirit 
When we prayed everything we know to pray, we prayed all the prayers we know to pray in English, and we don't know what else to pray. I'm going to be saying the same thing over and over and over again. There is nothing else I could say in my known language, so what do I do? I now allow the Holy Spirit to come along and take hold of my spirit and begin to pray through me with an utterance that I cannot speak out in my known language. I've, it's such a yearning from the Spirit. It's such a desire of the Holy Ghost that He wants to get through me, that He wants to use me to end. It's such a, a burden of the Holy Spirit that he doesn't want me just praying what I know to pray. He wants me to go deeper. He wants me to move beyond my natural and move into the spiritual side and allow him to use me as a vessel of prayer so that now I know once I've allowed the Holy Spirit to pray through me, his perfect will about this situation then I can stand up and say I don't understand it I don't know why it's happening but now I know now I'm convinced because I've allowed the Holy Spirit to take my spirit and pray what the Spirit of God wants to pray I can't do it in my own language so I've got to do it in other tongues i got to do it in the tongues of angels Tongues of men that I don't know. And when I do that, I can stand up. So I've prayed everything I know to pray in the natural. I've taken the scriptures. I've prayed them back to God. Everything I know about this situation, I've taken the scriptures. I've prayed it. I've prayed it to God. But yet I still didn't get a breakthrough. I still didn't get a release in prayer. Still don't have peace about not praying about it. So instead of just praying everything I've prayed already over again as if God couldn't remember, I allow the Holy Spirit then to take hold of my spirit and begin to pray. Then after that, when I get a release, I can stand up and say, I know, I'm convinced that this is going to turn out for my good. I don't see it now. I don't know, really know how, but I don't have to because I know. Church, he has a purpose for every person, born again and not born again. There's a purpose for every person living on the face of this earth. God said, second thing is, and that is, God's purposes cannot be stopped. God will use whoever he will. And then the third thing is, what is the third thing? The third thing is, what is the third thing? Yeah, that's it. I just want to make sure y'all paying attention. That in all situations, his purpose shall be fulfilled. Father, I thank you right now. Every person here and every person watching. Father, maybe they don't understand their purpose at this moment. Maybe they thought they missed their purpose. But help each one of us to realize today, Father. Every person watching, every person here, help us realize today, Father that you have a purpose for our lives and that it will not be stopped. And no matter what the situation is, your purpose will be fulfilled. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. And somebody say amen. Amen.